Uju gakana wea stafani ni nanijdagaz. Nagav chuanang ishkunaganig indonjaba. Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie. I'm from the Fond du Lac Reservation. I'm president of Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. Buju in Denawe Maganadog. Awanukwe Ojibwe Mong. Ivy Nin Indigena Kajagi Nashi Mong. Get your Negamin and Dunjaba. Eko in Denanoki. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, all my relatives. Uh, my name is Ivy Vinyo. My spirit name is Owanukwe. I am a Grand Portage Band of Ojibwe direct descendant. And I work as a cultural arts coordinator at the American Indian Community Housing Organization in Duluth, Minnesota. We welcome you to tonight's presentation by National Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. We are so excited to co-host this event along with ACO and hope you enjoy your evening. Others involved in supporting tonight's festivities include Oldenburg, Oldenburg Arts and Cultural Community, Minnesota Center for the Book, the Library of Congress, the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council, and the Northland Foundation. Joy Harjo is a writer and performer from the Muscogee Creek Nation. She is serving her third term as the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States and is the author of nine books of poetry, including An American Sunrise, several plays, children's books, and two memoirs. Throughout her career, she has received many honors, including the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement from the Poetry Foundation, the Academic, or excuse me, the Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, two NEA fellowships, and a Guggenheim fellowship. Bringing Joy is the outcome of the Bringing Joy Poetry Project started by the Oldenburg Arts and Cultural Community and was designed to engage local participants in a transformative experience with poetry aimed at helping them reimagine who they are. This project was founded on the understanding of Harjo's belief that poems are carriers of dreams, knowledge, and wisdom that connect us to the earth and to the spirit world, spiritual world. Tonight's event will be recorded and we will email a link to the recording to all of the registered, to all who registered for the event. Please note that closed captioning has been enabled and you can turn it on by clicking closed caption in the meeting controls. Miigwech for joining us for this special event, and especially to Joy Harjo for sharing your wonderful words. It's my honor to be able to sing an opening song for tonight. And this song comes to me through a woman who is my sponsor, my mentor, um, Nagamo Maingan. Uh, she goes by Sharon Day. Uh, and uh, this song is an honor song. And it is uh, sung in honor of Joy and the beautiful work that she does as Poet Laureate for the United States. In our culture, when we sing an honor song, we ask people to stand. So if you're feeling so inclined, uh, you, uh, of course, can do that, but we're on Zoom, so so uh, miigwech uh, for coming, uh, miigwech uh, in advance for listening to me. <laughs> Oh, 
Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. Thank you to the presenters of tonight's event, particularly the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College and ACO, as well as the Oldenburg Arts and Cultural Community for bringing us into collaboration for this event. On behalf of the Minnesota Center for the Book, we honor the Indigenous lands on which our organizations rest. We acknowledge we are located on ceded territory, still considered traditional lands by the Ojibwe people of the Northern region. We recognize and respect the Fond du Lac band of Lake Superior Chippewa as they identify themselves through tribal sovereignty, treaty rights, cultural resilience, and relationships. I also want to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which I broadcast tonight. We offer our gratitude to the elders of the past, to those living today and to those who will come in the future for their stewardship of this land and for their rich cultural legacy. We take time, <clears throat> excuse me, we take this time to consider the acts of violence, displacement and unjust treatment toward them that have occurred over many generations. We respectfully acknowledge that indigenous history is the original history of this land and that we are a part of their story. We contribute to this story by recognizing and celebrating the first peoples of the state. We're incredibly grateful at the Minnesota Center for the Book to have played a very small part in the process of bringing Joy Harjo to Minnesota, at least virtually, through partnership with the Library of Congress. It's been an honor to witness the community and relationship building that's been at the heart of this process. And it's truly a model for how state centers can work with local organizations to help bring access to amazing writers such as our US Poet Laureate. The Minnesota Center for the Book conducts several ongoing programs, including the Minnesota Book Awards, the touring program, Moving Words, Writers Across Minnesota, and the One Book, One Minnesota program, which brings Minnesotans together through stories. We offer online resources like the Minnesota Writers Directory and Minnesota Writers on the Map in honor of the writers who shaped the literary legacy of our state. Launching next year will be programming with the Minnesota Humanities Center and Minnesota's third poet laureate, Dr. Gwen Nell Westerman, a distinguished scholar and poet, an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapaton Dakota Oyate. We look forward to helping create programming that spreads the joy and wonder of poetry throughout the state, which is of course what we are all doing and taking part in tonight. So thank you all so much for being here in a shared love of poetry and in honor of our US Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo. Bonjour everyone, um, Linda Lagarde Grover in Dishinikaz, and I am um, from Net Lake, Minnesota, living here in Duluth, Anagamasing, Masabikong. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Joy Harjo to you. Joy is a, a poet, writer of essays, of she's a playwright, a musician. 
She is uh, multi-creative across many disciplines and really important to all of us in Indian country. She is a great encourager and helper to other Native people who are involved in these endeavors. And we, we, are, we are really thankful that, that she is such a, a wonderful citizen of our, of our great tribal nations. Joy was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I believe that's where she is today. She attended the Institute of American Indian Arts, and she began to write poetry when she was a student, a college student at the University of New Mexico. She was involved in the student organization, the Kiva Club. She, um, she then earned an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, and she has taught English, creative writing, American Indian studies at universities across the United States. She is author of nine books of poetry, and American Sunrise, her most recent, which is, I, I think it's my favorite so far, won an Oklahoma Book Award. Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings was shortlisted for the Griffin Prize and named a notable book of the year by the American Library Association. <clears throat> In Mad Love and War received an American Book Award and the Delmore Schwartz Memorial Award. She's won many awards for her books of poetry, the Ruth Lilly Prize for Lifetime Achievement, the Wallace Stevens Award, um, and of course the Guggenheim Fellowship. Joy's first memoir, Crazy Brave, was awarded the Penn USA Literary Award for Creative Nonfiction and the American Book Award. Her second memoir, Poet Warrior, a memoir, was released just this last month. She's author of two award-winning children's books, The Good Luck Cat and For a Girl Becoming. She has written several screenplays and collections of prose and three plays. Joy is executive director of, um, I'm sorry, executive editor of the anthology When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through. That's a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry and editor of Living Nations, Living Words, an anthology of First Peoples poetry that fe features the work of 47 Native Nations poets. Now this is through an interactive story map and a newly developed Library of Congress audio collection. Multi-genres here. Joy works with her saxophone and flutes solo and with her band, the, the Aerodynamics Band, and previously with Joy Harjo and Poetic Justice. They've toured in many countries around the world. She has produced several, seven award-winning albums and has been awarded a NAMI for Best Female Artist of the Year. She serves as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, holds a Tulsa Artist Fellowship, directs For Girls Becoming, an arts mentoring program for young Muscogee women, and is a founding member and chair of the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. Foundation. She has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Philosophical Society, the National Native American Hall of Fame, and the National Women's Hall of Fame. And here is a story about joy that involves me. Not long after the stunningly beautiful and lovingly written for a girl becoming was released. Joy was the featured poet here in Duluth in Agamasing for the Spirit Lake Poetry Series. And that is where I first met her. We shared a breakfast and some time together. I, um, I got to read with her and we drove around Duluth looking at the lake, the rocky hills and the expanse of the horizon. I really enjoyed talking and hanging out with Joy, and it's a memory that I hold dear. And one reason for this, and only one of the reasons, is that I thought, and I still think, she was not only the coolest poet, but the coolest person I had ever met. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Joy Harjo. Madho, thank you. Thank you for the incredible welcoming, uh, not just for me, but for everyone here, everyone who is attending this event and all of everybody, everyone who is gathered here right now. And it really does open the door. So I appreciate that. I'm here, uh, I guess, Joy Harjo Chio Chifkiros. I am a member of the Muskogee Creek Nation. I'm Oji Above the Ceremonial Grounds, and I'm speaking to you from 
the Muskogee Creek Nation Reservation here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I've been up to your part of the world many times and uh, well, not many, but some. And I've met many of the poets and people from up that way in that beautiful way. And I was thinking about what I was going to read tonight and it, it, it does, you can finally feel the fall coming. There's a full moon getting full. And, and I love that so we were talking beforehand about the, the moon on the water and I could smell it and I could hear the, the, I could hear the quiet, the water and, and, and feel it. So I think tonight I will read poetry, but I'm going to read some from the memoir, Poet Warrior, which weaves poetry, you know, weaves poetry. But because of the changing of the seasons, I just thought it would be good to read some, to read a little bit of stories too. But I'm going to start with this one. It's called For Calling the Spirit Back from Wandering the Earth in Its Human Feet. And I guess, the too, it's something we do in the fall and as we head towards winter, especially in climates where we have cold weather or colder weather, is we do start calling, you know, we've been out, we've been, there's been harvest and all that, and we start calling ourselves back in um, to, to be in another kind of way. But we also do that in in ages, in a way, that's what's been going on in the pandemic, because we had to call ourselves back for a while to kind of to remember who we are, what's going on, and to recognize the crisis that we're in together, and we've been in together at so many levels, and and um, to find ways to that we can gather together and figure out figure it out in ways that include the good of everyone. We're calling the spirit back from wandering the earth in its human feet. Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle of pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth, gathering essences of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude. If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the stars, ears, and back. Acknowledge the earth that is who has cared for you since you were a dream planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the guardians who have known you before time, who will be there after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. Be respectful of the small insects, birds, and animal people who accompany you. Ask their forgiveness for the harm we humans have brought down upon them. Don't worry. The heart knows the way, though there may be high rises, interstates, checkpoints, armed soldiers, massacres, wars, and those who will despise you because they despise themselves. The journey might take you a few hours, a day, a year, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Watch your mind. Without training, it might run away and leave your heart for the immense human feast set by thieves of time. Do not hold regrets. When you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. You must clean yourself with cedar sage or other healing plant. Cut the ties you have to failure and shame. Let go of the pain you are holding in your mind, your shoulders, your heart, all the way to your feet. Let go of the pain of your ancestors to make way for those who are heading in our direction. Ask for forgiveness. Call upon the help of those who love you. Call your spirit back. It may be caught in corners and creases of shame, judgment, and human abuse. You must call in a way that your spirit will want to return. Speak to it as you would a beloved child. Welcome your spirit back from its wandering. It may return in pieces and tatters. Gather them together. 
They will be happy to be found after being lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep a while after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves and supports you. Keep room for those who have no place else to go. Make a giveaway. And remember, keep the speeches short. Then you must do this. Help the next person find their way through the dark. Okay. I was going to read, maybe because I was just out in LA. I had to go help record something. And um, I wound up living there for a little while, I think because I said, I will never live in LA. And never is a never is one of those dangerous magic words. Anytime you say never, you're going to find yourself doing that. It also goes along with the law of judgment. When you judge somebody else pointedly, there you are doing the same thing. And um, I will find it here. I guess I didn't write down the page number. But yeah, let's see. I'll have to look it up here. I know I'm almost there. Here it is. So, so anyway, I was we were taping about a few blocks from the first place I lived there, which was an apartment right off a studio apartment, a tiny little place right off Wilcox and Hollywood Boulevard. I had never lived in a place like that. I didn't live in that little place long and um, then moved to Laurel Canyon and then stayed with my cousin and then et cetera, et cetera. The path to the Milky Way leads through Los Angeles. There are strangers above me, below me, and all around me, and we are all strange in this place of recent invention. This city named for angels appears naked and stripped of anything resembling the shaking of turtle shells the songs of human voices on a summer night outside Okmogi. Yet it's perpetually summer here and beautiful. The shimmer of gods is easier to perceive at sunrise or dusk. When those who remember us here in the illusion of the marketplace turn toward the changing of the sun and say our names, we matter to somebody. We must matter to the strange God who imagines us as we revolve together in the dark sky on the path to the Milky Way. We can't easily see that starry road from the perspective of the crossing of boulevards, can't hear it in the whine of civilization or taste the minerals of planets and hamburgers. But we can buy a map of the stars' homes, dial a tone for dangerous love, choose from several brands of water, or a hiss of oxygen for gentle rejuvenation. Everyone knows you can't buy love, but you can still sell your soul for less than a song to a stranger who will sell it to someone else for a profit until you're owned by a company of strangers in this city of strange and getting stranger. I'd rather understand how to sing from a crow who is never good at singing or much of anything, but finding gold in the trash of humans. So what are we doing here? I asked the crow parading on the ledge of falling that hangs over this precarious city. Crow just laughs and says, wait, wait, and see. And I am waiting and not seeing anything, not just yet. But like crow, I collect the shine of anything beautiful I can find. So during the pandemic, I've been working, I got a new album out. I'll play a song on that in a little while. I got a new album out and called I Pray For My Enemies, an album of music and got out, um, worked on the anthology, the Poet Laureate Project and this memoir. My last memoir, Crazy Brave, 
It was 14 years late to the publisher. That's another story. And this one I got in ahead of time. And uh, I'm just going to talk and read some selections from here. It opens, it kind of opens with, it opens, what opened it for me was the memory of going with my Aunt Lois all over the Creek Nation and visiting with relatives, the elders. And she was a little older than me. And I used to drive her around. I would drive her around. That was one of my favorite things to do is to hear those stories. And we would go visit. One guy, we, one cousin of hers we liked to visit was George Kozer. And he had a lot of stories. And he'd been the rodeo. He knew rope tricks. And he was quite a talker. And he knew, all, he knew a lot of good stories. And the book ends with my cousin George Kozer Jr. and I visiting, talking the same, <laughs> you know, it's like it doesn't end. We're, we're still, you know, it's part of a spiral. I was going to say a circle, but it's not a closed circle. It just it's more like a spiral. I returned to the stories that I was told. And... Um, Thank you for the, the interpreter, the sign interpreter. <laughs> You're doing a great job. What is your name, Ta Talon? And um, yeah, so I know it can be hard to keep you doing great. <laughs> Thank you. I return to the stories that I was told. The stories I can't seem to remember or keep straight to the telling. Like the ones I heard when I used to drive my Aunt Lois around the Creek Nation to visit our relatives, all her age and older, which is near the age I am now. This was when I was in my 20s and 30s and when she lived in her apartment on West 8th Avenue, West 8th Street in Okmogee, before she was disabled with a stroke and taken to a nursing home to live out the last few years of her life. Every day I miss her cultural knowledge of our people, her insight and humor. I miss the historical documents and family artifacts that crowded her small apartment that told of our family's part in the forced march from the South to Indian Territory to what became known as Oklahoma. These stacks contained written accounts of family stories of bravery and justice, but left out the story she told me of favorite black dogs horse magic, bending time, how to avoid the places where known conjurers lived, and of the Spanish man accompanying the people on the trail who wore a diamond pin that glittered as he sat tall on his horse. One of her paintings accompanies me through my life since her passing. It is a painting of a Taos man pulling a piece of pottery out of fire. She used to make many trips to the Southwest and was friends with many of the Pueblo people including Maria Martinez, the San Ildefonso Potter. I am now friends with her grandchildren. When I was with her, I knew I belonged. And in, that, and in this circle of belonging, I had a place in the stories. Everyone needs this kind of place, this feeling of kinship. Without it, we are lost children wandering the earth our whole lives without a sense of belonging. Even a country can be like a lost child because it may have no roots in the earth on which it has established itself. I miss being in my aunt's tall physical presence, her graceful and private bearing. Her spiritual presence remains urging me forward to understanding and love, to, to knowledge given by her example. She was an artist, a painter, a lover of the arts, of native arts and cultures. She worked at the Creek Council House and taught art classes in Okmogee. I am writing in an apartment in downtown Tulsa. I was born before cell phones and computers, before the proliferation of devices installed with memory, which prompt the user to forget. I do not want to forget, though sometimes memory appears to be an enemy bringing only pain. There are so many memories. One returned my mother to me. 
that memory opened up in a dream. There she was sitting on the roof of a house in red shorts, not long after she gave birth to me. I wish that I had written down everything my aunt and all the elders told me so I could have their wisdom, their struggles, their hard-won stories right here for referral to provoke, even cultivate new stories. Growing memories and the ability to access memory is a skill that allows access to eternity. It is within all of us. I do not have the best memory. I often tell the circle of old ones whom, when I speak with them, and I do speak with those whom I love who have moved on from this earthly realm, especially when writing poetry or any kind of story or music. They remind me, here's your opportunity to practice memory. I am not the best speaker or listener, I tell them. Take your opportunity with grace, they tell me. You are here to learn. Learn how to listen, how to walk into each challenging story without fear, fearless. I have asked my aunt, uncles, cousins and others, all those with whom I sat, listened, and shared throughout this life to be with me as I write. It is a very different world within which you make stories, share, and participate, they tell me. Too many words, I heard one grandfather remark. What is it with you in all these English words? These times were predicted, a time in which the birds would be confused about which direction to fly to migrate. A time in which the sun would darken with pollution, a time in which there would be confusion and famine. In these kinds of times, we are in great danger of forgetting our original teachings, the nature of the kind of world we share, and what it requires of us. In this world of forgetfulness, they told me, you will forget how to nourish the connection between humans, plants, animals, and the elements, a connection needed to make food for your mind, heart, body, and spirit. You were born of a generation that promised to help remember. Each generation makes a person. You came in together to make change. That's one section. And uh, I'm gonna read this, this other section here. As I near the last doorway of this present life, I am trying to understand the restless path on which I have traveled. My failures have been my most exacting teachers. They are all linked by one central characteristic, that, and that is the failure to properly regard the voice of inner truth. That voice speaks softly. It is not judgmental, full of pride, or otherwise loud. It does not deride, shame, or otherwise attempt to derail you. When I fail to trust what my deepest knowing tells me, I suffer. The voice of inner truth or the knowing has access to the wisdom of eternal knowledge. The perspective of that voice is timeless. I would never have become a poet if I hadn't listened to that small inner voice that told me that poetry was the path, even when I had different plans. All of the other voices of educators, friends, voices of love and concern told me that Poetry was an impossible vocation. It is an impossible vocation. <laughs> they reminded me that I, they reminded me I had two small children to raise alone, that I could change my major to education. Then I could teach poetry if I wanted to be invested in poetry. Instead, I listened to that humble voice that did not need to puff itself up or have approval to be chosen. I have made choices that have made no sense to anyone else, but they were the right choices for me. I didn't always understand them either. Even the choice to be a poet is still often a mystery, just as the need to create and make music. When I listen, I am always led in the right direction. That doesn't mean the resultant path is easy. It might be the more difficult path. You may have to clear boulders, walk through fire after fire, or try to find footing in precarious flooding. You will play the wrong notes and write words that mean nothing to anyone else but you. And you may appear to have followed the wrong path, even though it was the right path as you fail over and over again. 
So that's part of that. I'm just reading sections out of here just to be helpful. This part here, this is, um, somebody asked me earlier in the, in the earlier session about writing what was difficult. So I might read some of that here. Yes, I will. Let's see. It's a whole book. It's I, I go over some of the territory of Crazy Brave, but from a different kind of place and then go go farther than that into, um, into other places. But I'm going to read this difficult part because while writing this, I don't always know what's going to happen when I write and I just follow and listen and then help construct something. So in this book, there is a, it's kind of became a poetic voice called Girl Warrior. She's a character representative probably of a younger me and she's going through difficulty. And I didn't have a coming of age ceremony when I was a young woman. I needed, we all need, we all need those doorways. And so when I came to this part in the book that was difficult and painful to write, uh, some part of me said, went back into time to make, to bring people together to make that ceremony for this young woman who was, yes, represents me, but represents in a way all of our young women coming of age who need a community, the circle of, especially the mothers, grandmothers around them, but the whole family, the circle of family around them. So, yeah, it was interesting when this happened. And I thought, I didn't know I could do this in a book. So, but I think by nature, poetry, song, we heard a song, uh, we, we heard prayer and welcoming. By nature, it's kind of, it's like ritual. We need, it's like patterning. And we need that. When we come of age, we need that doorway. I think of a poem in a way as being in an, in its by its nature, you know, ritualistic or ceremony. There's the title that calls you in, and then each line, in a way, brings a gift or brings something that is needed for that particular coming together of a poem. So this girl warrior, that's her name, and then she becomes after the ceremony they give her the name. You'll hear. I think I have. Remind me if I don't say it here. I'm running a little on jet lag. <laughs> okay. Girl warrior lied and said she was going out with her friend to hang out at her house. She wasn't a friend, rather a girl she barely knew. And had a bad feeling when she asked her to double date. Because some of these kind of go into poems and then it goes into narrative. And had a bad feeling when she... Girl, start again. Girl... <laughs> Girl warrior lied and said she was going out with her friend to hang out at her house. She wasn't a friend, rather a girl she barely knew and had a bad feeling when she asked her to double date. Girl warrior was not allowed to date, nor was she usually allowed to go anywhere with friends or without. But she begged her mother and her stepfather was working late, i.e. he was seeing a woman on the other side of town. Girl warrior got in the car and knew her fate was in the hands of reckless strangers. She had a dime taped under her shoe for a phone, inside her shoe for a phone call. But who would she call if there was trouble? No one. They drove to another town. Her date was 10 years older. He bought them beer. What the hell? It was the first time she had anything resembling a date. She wanted to be normal. Every drink made her feel more and more normal. Girl Warrior's new girlfriend left with her boyfriend without telling her. She saw the red of their taillights disappear into darkness that grew larger and larger until Girl Warrior had no way to get home. She just wanted to be normal, drink Cokes, flip her hair back and laugh with someone who might offer his hand, his jacket, or other small kindness between new friends. There was more beer, if she wanted a ride before her stepfather made it back to the house, she had to pay the darkness either way. This is how I came of age by a tightrope slung between my desires and the desires of others. 
I was hungry for ritual. Ritual creates belonging. We are all in a ritual marked by sunrise, day, sunrise, daylight, sunset, night, and moon phases. We also move within the ritual of the changing of seasons, either fall, winter, spring, and summer, or dry and rainy seasons. Our cultural practices are arranged according to these earth rituals. We all need rituals of becoming in which we are given instructions that define our relationship with becoming, with our, with our relatives, those sharing this whole world around us. This is how it was meant to be for those coming up at all stages of our becoming in this life. In these times, however, of degradation of our physical, mental, and spiritual sources of nourishment, we are losing ourselves and our children. Until we understand and act as if we are the earth, then each of us will experience the pain of separation from sacred knowledge from ourselves. I walk back in time to help make a coming of age ceremony for Girl Warrior. I construct a doorway where sunrise is a line above a dark blue horizon. Her grandmothers and great grandmothers gather around and speak. Her, the ancestors appear here to help because she is one of us. She is us. She is worthy of love, of tenderness, of all that she needs to create a future. The world lives within the cradle of her hips. She is every girl, this girl. They tell her that every seven years marks a renewal, a shift, and a test. Seven is considered a sacred number. Within it are the four directions above, below, and within. It makes a complete cycle. They tell her that the second cycle of seven in our lives marks a crisis in becoming. We mature into adulthood. A boy becomes a man, a girl becomes a woman. Becoming includes countless range of gender expression. Be exactly who you are, they tell her, in your becoming. They remind her that she is holding tremendous power and power has two sides. It could harm or heal. To hold such power can be difficult. That's why we need guidance and ritual and ceremony, especially at this age, but at any age, for power without grounding and sharing can destroy. In our Muscogee tribal traditions, adolescence is a time of teaching and celebration, the old ones say. As you enter this doorway of womanhood, they tell her, you must keep the fire going of Anugetchka. No, Aga, sorry, Agasama, Samga or spiritual belief. You must seek and acquire a spiritual understanding of life. Your relationship with your creator is central. Tend it with quiet and communion. Turn your eyes and ears inward and listen. Begin every morning tending this fire. Imadalamga is community. Your body is a community of organs, all living with consciousness. They work, they work together to house you in this story. Community is those with whom you live, from home to school, to your tribal nation, city, or state. You must remember to place community and interest, community interest and benefits above individual personal and personal gain. Always be kind and humble. Iaskara is humility. None of us is above the other. Athlequechka means respect. Respect this gift of life, and in doing so, we respect ourselves and others. Fajra is integrity. Be honest. Tell the truth. Keep an ethical stance. Emen honatleta tayat translates as trust. Take responsibility for every act, thought, or dream. Hoposlinga is the continual gaining of wisdom. Listen, study hard, beloved granddaughter. In Homadetta is leadership. We are all put here to be leaders within ourselves, our families and our communities, be a leader. Do not forget that we are here and will always be here for you. You can call on us anytime, we love you. They wrap girl warrior in a new blanket and walk her out to the doorway of her beginning which is also a new beginning for us, her family. A beautiful sunrise brightens the sky. She's given her new name. She is given gifts. One gives her plants that will help her to help herself and others. 
and then so on and so on. And it says, you are becoming in a time in which you will see the world turn upside down before it is renewed, they tell her. And so through that, she becomes poet warrior. Children coming of age need to be taught by the elders who pass on what has strengthened and, and inspired them in life. When this time of becoming is honored by their families, their community, the young ones emerge into adulthood with the, in, with the lit charge to develop spiritually, mentally, and physically, and on, are on an intimate part of carrying the community into the future. Okay. Let me see. I have another story here. Here's a little piece. This is like a, po a little poem inside the narrative. Poet warrior reached for a gun. She was given a paintbrush, a saxophone, a pen. These will be your instruments of power, the old one said. Though the gun gleamed and pranced as a tool of takeover by governments, even as it danced to the imagination of revolutionary, imaginations of revolutionaries as a perfect tool for social change. Do not be fooled, they told her. Violence might be louder, tougher, and it is often good looking. The power of insight and compassion is fiercely humble and helpful. Be ready for what your age demands. You will be tested. There will be jealousy envy, but the most difficult enemies will be from your closest circle, even your family. You must act in a manner that will cause no harm to anyone seven generations back or forward. See, when I write, it's, I feel like, it's like I'm listening. I feel like I'm being taught as I write. And um, I think what I'll do here is shift a little bit and play one of my new songs from the album, um, I Pray For My Enemies. And um, let's see, you guys, I think you'll be able to hear it. This one I wrote as the pandemic started. I have a, a grandfather that I was, I'm very close to. He passed before I came. And so this is kind of in honor of him, this song. But when that pandemic started, I remember looking outside and it was so quiet. And we needed that for reflection. It's called How Love Blows Through the Trees. <laughs> Thank you. 
My grandfather flew like smoke to the sky side of earth He left us here in this place he blessed What stories you carried were laughter wrapped memory Now I am standing in the kitchen And I can hear him singing Pass this love on, he said It knows how to bend, it will never burn It's the only thing with a give and take The more you choose, the more you think That love is a bridge that will cross the river home He'd be standing in the dark with no one listening How time blows steadily through the trees How time blows steadily through the sea I think I will, thank you. I'll, I'm going to end with this poem. It's a new one. And um, it's called Without. And I wanna thank you for inviting me here to be up in your community. Even if it's virtual, we're all still here. And I can feel that moon on the lake. without. The world will keep trudging through time without us when we lift from the story contest to fly home. We will be as falling stars to those watching from the edge of grief and heartbreak. Maybe then we will see the design of the two-minded creature and know why half the world fights righteously for greedy masters and the other half is nailing it all back together through the smoke of cooking fires, lovers' trysts, and endless human industry. Maybe then, beloved rascal, we will find each other again in the timeless weave of breathing. We will sit under the trees in the shadow of earth's sorrows, watch hyenas drink rain, and laugh. What's the word for hyenas in sign language? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Meadow. Thank spelled you. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, we would like to present you with a gift from the college, as is our tradition here at Fond du Lac. We have uh, this beautiful wool blanket. You can see a little bit of it here. Um, it's, it was designed by local Ojibwe artist and Fond du Lac band member, Sarah Agaton House. 
The Renewal Heartberry Blanket is a representation of the woodland's floral tradition. The design honors the land through the wild plum flower, the water through the wild rice, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, design, and healing through the dogwood flower, which is used to create traditional tobacco, a sema. It is inspired by the artist's regalia. The scallop shape symbolize that humans are part of nature, part of the constant renewal and revitalization of the land, water, sky, and spirit, which requires us to understand and practice our ancestral ways. I was taught the gifting of a blanket to someone represents respect, admiration, and honor for the individual and hope that you will accept it with these thoughts in mind. We will mail the blanket to you soon, and we only wish we could present it to you in person. But thank you so much. Mado, thank you. I'm so honored to be here with you in your community. I've always had a good time with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, so miigwech, uh, Joy. Um, such a special evening uh, with you. And our, I think there was like, almost 400 people on this session. So that was pretty cool. Um, the American Indian Community Housing Organization, which houses the ACO Art Gallery, um, is proud to work with, advocate, and support almost 80 Indigenous and diverse artists, um, locally, uh, regionally, and national artists. Uh, we commissioned a local Pyramid Lake Paiute uh, artist uh, by the name of Shanoa Williams to create a beaded medallion for you. And she was, she was inspired by you and um, came up with the design. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited. I've been just, can't wait to show you. So totally inspired by you. Um, okay, let me see if I can get this. Well, wow. and then it's got like, that's beautiful up there. Um, and so I'm just going to read uh, her artist statement on this medallion. Um, the medallion is inspired by a life well lived and not always within the parameters of what is expected. It is not perfect. It has visible scars and stories that accompany them. When I was asked to make this beaded medallion, I had no idea what I would create. I usually make things on feelings and intuition. The design was an honest version of a perceived lie of perfection. The original design is less, in less is more, more or less. This was also a version of broken things that are more beautiful when the cracks are visible. I listened to Joy Harjo on YouTube. I wanted to get a feel of an essence. My feel was that imperfect lived risk, risks taken were what I would base my design on. It's honest in your face. You can, cannot de deny its power. In the end, the idea of cracks are transformed into a power source like lightning. Hmm. And so that is from Shanoa Williams. She is an incredible artist and... Um, yeah, so I want to just say miigwech to Shanoa Williams, also to Sarah Egerton House for um, sharing their designs with us to give to you or gift to you. And uh, miigwech to you, Joy, for your time, uh, your words, your inspiration, uh, your music. That was so lovely. And uh, being a force of indigenous resilience, uh, creativity, and light. So miigwech from all of us at ACO. Uh, Duluth Community um, here in Minnesota and uh, Fond du Lac Tribal Community College. Meadow, thank you so much. The stories behind all of that, that, that makes perfect sense. And yeah. that design, I've never seen a design yeah. quite like that. It's really, and that's yeah. true. That's true for all of us, you know, about those cracks. I think that for me, that's what turned me around because I was suicidal and cutting myself and all of that when I was a young woman. And, and um, at one point, I finally learned that it's those cracks. Those are what 
they're actually more interesting ultimately, <laughs> you know, that it was stuff that I could use the stuff of that to build something mm -hmm. rather than use it as a weapon to destroy me. Mm. It was a hard thing to learn. And we still, you know, I, we all, you know, you've learned it, but you go through different aspects of it, but it's ultimately we learn these things to help others. Yeah. All right. Miigwech. Okay. Well, thank you all so much in the audience for joining us this evening and special thanks to Fond du Lac faculty member, Darcy Schumer, who helped uh, really pull this all thing together. She did a, just a wonderful job. So proud to have her at the college. And uh, this concludes our evening and stay safe, everyone. And thank you so much. Giga Wabaman. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>